Welcome to Antarctic Stories, a podcast that takes you behind the scenes into the rich world of people who live, work, and undertake daring expeditions in the polar regions. My name is Heather Thorkelson, and I'll be your host today. Caitlin Webster wears many hats, working as a marine biologist, photographer, polar diver, and illustrator across all seven continents. She has been fortunate enough to travel to particularly remote regions of the world through opportunities focusing on scientific research, marine conservation, and ecotourism. Regardless of location, her enthusiasm for exploring and sharing the beauty within our natural world is steadfast and unparalleled. The sea has become the constant in Caitlin's life, and it brings her sheer joy, a sense of self, and an unquenchable thirst to investigate each drop within it. Growing up relatively landlocked, Caitlin longed for her escape to the sea when her family spent holidays on the California coast. Immersing in the temperate, salty waters gave her a sense of inner peace while igniting a fervent curiosity and appreciation for this ecosystem. Upon moving to the coast, Caitlin earned her scuba certification in high school and became instantly addicted to breathing underwater. She pursued her passion for diving via research and consequently earned her degree in biological sciences with a concentration in marine science and fisheries from Cal Poly State University, San Luis Obispo. Her adventures all began with the first of many uniquely obscure jobs working as a research technician in none other than a barnacle laboratory. Not that one of the most notable animals of Darwin's obsessive affections, yes, barnacles, weren't ostentatious enough for Caitlin, she had a restless desire to travel abroad and experience other facets within biology. This laid the foundation for her to pursue international research opportunities across the globe, studying everything from great white sharks in South Africa to crown of thorns sea stars in American Samoa. Traveling, diving, and interpreting natural history in extreme conditions, from the equator all the way to both polar regions, has allowed Caitlin to experience a wide array of ecosystems and unique cultures. Whether staying up all night to collect nocturnally spawning coral gametes in the tropics, exploring underwater cave systems, or braving the large gape of leopard seals while filming in the sub-zero waters of Antarctica, Each experience has fueled her passion to continue marine conservation efforts and to spread her knowledge of the natural world with others. Although Caitlin is constantly on the go, she considers herself at home when the sea surrounds her. At home in San Diego, California, she is currently working with Scripps Institution of Oceanography, carrying out research expeditions within strict pandemic regulations and continues to develop science communication content through visual arts and personal narratives. Caitlin Webster, welcome to Antarctic Stories. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, I'm so excited to speak with you today because I am really, really curious about the underwater world in the polar regions. I've only ever seen what it looks like down there on things like BBC specials, as I'm sure most of our listeners have had the same experience because (laughs) so few people get to go diving in the polar regions. (laughs) So this is very, very personally interesting for me to learn more about from an actual human being who has done this. So, you know, we learned a lot about you and your background in your bio, but I would love for us to start out with you telling us exactly how you got started working in the polar regions and specifically diving in the polar regions. (laughs) Right. That is fair. It is not necessarily the most uh, common (laughs) expertise, you could say, Um, and My diving background has definitely been varied all across the world, but my background in particular is in scientific diving and particularly remote research operations and logistics. And I first started out in my home base, actually, of Southern California, which is not necessarily the coldest nor the most intimidating place to dive, like the polar regions, but it completely 
blew my mind the first time I was able to simply breathe underwater. And I just thought to myself, how is everyone not doing this right now? (laughs) This is the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. And that spurred a very interesting and dynamic career in marine biology and studying the sea via scuba. And it led to my first job as a kelp forest monitor. So being a kelp forest monitor, I would quite literally count the stipes or the long trunk-like portions of kelp um, and record all of this and record all of the ecological aspects and key species that helped indicate if it was a healthy ecosystem for my job. And in doing this, we accumulated a ton of dry suit dives, not necessarily because it was freezing cold temperatures in Southern California, but rather because we were diving so often and so frequently throughout the day, we would utilize dry suits. And so dry suits are a totally different ball game than your more run-of-the-mill uh, neoprene wetsuits that much, much, much more people are familiar with. And in theory, <laughs> a dry suit has these crazy seals, um, latex seals on your neck and your wrists in an attempt to actually keep the inside portion of this space suit essentially dry on the inside. And so you fill it up with air and have a vent on your left arm in order to let some of that air out. And between my very uh, diverse experiences working in Africa and in the South Pacific, uh, these really remote places. Along the way, I made a wonderful friend I still have to this day that gave me an intro to my diving in the polar regions. And Mm. so one day, very funny, small world scenario, she was actually interviewing and applying for my old job as a kelp forest monitor and asked Mm. if she could put me down as a reference. And so I said, yes, of course, you'd be a great fit. And at the same time, I was planning my next professional steps. And maybe not even a month later, I get this message completely out of the blue asking, hey, do you want to go diving in the Arctic with National Geographic? Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Which is like, who says that? (laughs) Who sends that message and who receives it? Um, (laughs) Well, it was my lucky day that I did. And uh, I went through a very rigorous series of Skype interviews, which you might appreciate, while um, this fantastic man, Dennis Cornejo, who's one of the godfathers of diving in the Antarctic, for sure. Um, He was trying to do these Skype interviews while he was on an expedition ship in Norwegian fjords. So (laughs) just about every other word was like, oh, oh, I can't quite hear you. But eventually we managed to (laughs) get through it. And, um, And within a few emails and interviews, they said, okay, great. How soon can you mobilize? Which is one of my favorite phrases a boss has ever asked me. (laughs) And within a matter of maybe two weeks, I found myself destined for the Ritz-Carlton in Oslo, Norway, which was a dream in a dream. It was one of those pinch me experiences that you can't even believe until you're there in it. And so we were heading for Svalbard and I was beyond excited to get the opportunity to not only see the Arctic, but also dive underwater. And so my job that um, I developed after that first incredible experience was working as a very rare specialized job called an undersea specialist. And so the idea is that regardless of where you are in the world, you are going to interpret the natural history of 
everything and anything under the sea, which is very helpful when you can go scuba diving and bring a big old camera rig in order to bring the incredible life that is underwater that most people are not seeing and bring that to the surface to share it with the guests and various people that might be on board an expedition ship. So it definitely was not the most direct path, <laughs> but um, a rather rare and fortunate, very right place at the right time kind of a way to For sure. get there. <laughs> and, you know, it sounds a little bit like, you know, preparation meets opportunity without you realizing that the opportunity would come up, right? Like you just happen to have the right Completely. combination of skills and experience and like spending a lot of time in dry suits and all this kind of stuff and not necessarily in the cold, cold water, but nevertheless, you know, and the photography background, all that kind of stuff. So that's, oh, it's so wonderful when you get that kind of synchronicity, right? Right. I mean, there's very rare circumstances where you can unintentionally become qualified for the job of your dreams that you yeah. didn't even know existed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it was... It was an absolutely incredible alignment and and definitely what people don't realize is that there were, you know, years and years of diving courses and emergency preparations that I was part of teams developing and designing and mm -hmm. so many different aspects that led up to someone asking me that kind of a question initially. And a lot of people are like, you know, how do I do it? How do I get in? And I feel like it's really difficult to break into because it really is a very kind of closed insular market that you don't necessarily want to bring on somebody that's super green and super eager, even though those qualities can work very favorably nine times out of 10, you want somebody that's really assured under the water because diving in polar regions is really just not even comparable <laughs> to mm -hmm. so many normal or recreational diving activities where um, you're in a totally different, just almost freezing, <laughs> Some, yeah. sometimes on the brink of freezing cold environment. <laughs> Yeah, and different um, risks associated with that—not just the freezing cold temperatures, but also ice and stuff. Right? I mean, it's a it's a dramatically oh, yes. different environment than what most people would dive in. So, right. I, on that note, I'm curious because you know, I, as much as I'm a polar guide, I don't like the cold. <laughs> Never been a fan of the cold. And so I'm I'm wondering, you know, and I've done diving in South Africa, which is cold water, mm -hmm. but it's it's not polar cold. Um <laughs> so how uncomfortable is it to dive in such cold water and what special precautions are taken? Like is there a time limit before it becomes dangerous for you to be in the water? Definitely. There are tons of precautions that normally you would never even think of. I mean, the the biggest, scariest one you could say is that up in the Arctic, you have to have your rifle in the boat and be alert for polar bears because they are oh. very much marine mammals. <laughs> it's part of the part of the risk of diving up there is that yes, you might come upon a polar bear and a swimming polar bear. A swimming polar bear, yeah. And yep. <laughs> I mean, I have definitely seen one swim for over a mile and then sneak attack a seal just out on an ice floe. And out of nowhere, it just bursts out of the water, grabs the seal, brings it back down into the water. And then, you know, this suspenseful moment of, oh my God, oh my God, did it get it? What's happening? Yeah. And then it comes back victorious with this massive ringed seal. And whew, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, their capabilities are far superior, unfortunately, to my own and my dive buddies. But Thankfully, I have had uh, not even a close encounter with something like a polar bear while in the water, but definitely massive hunks of ice or icebergs are a huge component of the kinds of things you have to think about and prepare for and keep calm is honestly one of the biggest hurdles because 
once you dive into polar waters, be it in the Arctic or Antarctic, you actually feel kind of a sense of a relief (laughs) because Mm -hmm. it can take so long to get all of your equipment that involves heavy, warm, insulating layers, massive weights to offset your big bulky dry suit, your huge heavy tank. And on your tank, we have repetition. Repetition and staying calm are key in polar diving because Mm -hmm. when you put this big old tank of compressed air on your back that you're pulling and breathing air from and changing the not only pressure, but temperature of that air as it's being pulled out of the tank into your breathing hose and then into your regulator that fits into your mouth. And occasionally, either the surrounding water can be so cold, or if you say, inhale too swiftly, actual ice crystals (gasps) can start to form in the hose, the air hose, and into your regulator. Oh my God. Which, as you can imagine, is not great. (laughs) But we have we have this all built into our emergency procedures for if and when that happens. And the issue with when that does happen is that if your regulator, the part of a scuba setup that fits into your mouth and delivers the air. If that detects any kind of issue or say a particle, like a chunk of ice or a bit of sand, something that might mess with the mechanics of your air, instead of completely shutting off, it completely shuts open wide. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah, which um, I can assure you is not fun to deal with in minus one Celsius or even minus two degrees. Uh, Water is a face full of full blast bubbles. So if you think about when you have like a, a hose that you're watering your lawn with and then you stick your thumb over the top of it to spray that water. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a similar similar analogy of how that air is being distributed from, um, you know, constant stream of air to this full force bubbles in your face. So there, there is a way to still breathe from that. And because we have this redundancy built in, we basically have this completely separate second set of regulator and air hose that is attached with a different unit to the compressed air. And so that's basically your backup that you can okay. switch out, put in your mouth and basically turn off your bubble explosion. (laughs) Um, So it definitely takes staying calm in order to keep your wits about you, but it also takes having a dive partner that can realize what's happening or is also trained in realizing either what's going on with themselves or with you so that they can properly respond to that. So um, not the most pleasant thing to be sure. There's also things like freezing cold leaks into your supposedly dry suit (laughs) or, um, you know, be coming face to face with something like a huge leopard seal that can definitely be unnerving, (laughs) exciting, but also terrifying at the same time. And, and so one of the things that I actually love about diving and especially in polar regions is that it forces you to be very present and mindful in that moment and focus on just breathing in and breathing out because you really are limited to about maybe 45 minutes maximum before your appendages get so cold and your brain gets so cold that you really stop being able to make well-informed choices and decisions because the water is just simply that cold, regardless of how many layers you put on. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, as you were describing all this, I thought, you know, you must have to go into almost like a Zen mindset, right? Because you have to be hyper aware of 
your gear. You have to be hyper aware of your surroundings. And you do, you have this limited biological time before your body starts to go into a different state. And yeah, you're not, you're not making proper decisions anymore. And, you know, of all things you could be doing in freezing cold water, diving is a time where you need all your wits about you. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the brain freeze is definitely real, but, um, it's, it's very funny. You know, you wear, you wear all of this gear and people can, can see that blatantly that you wear in a heck of a lot of gear Mm. and more often than not, I will actually be sweating by the time I'm on the boat and out to our dive site. And you finally roll back into this freezing ice cold water, seawater. And it's actually kind of like, whoo. Yeah, it's like a relief (laughs) in the beginning. (laughs) Relief in the beginning, which is so funny because, I mean, you know what's coming. And no matter um, the incredible advances in things like heated undergarments (gasps) and Mm. heated gloves that actually connect through our dry suits to this big, massive external battery that we strap onto the side of our tanks. And, oh, they are complete game changers. But even so, the wonderful advantage of having heated gloves, electrically heated gloves, is really just delaying the inevitable, which is you're going to get (laughs) cold. And it's, it's really just a matter of time. But for those first, you know, I would argue maybe six minutes, depending on where you are and how deep you are, Mm -hmm. it is sheer bliss. (laughs) It is the most (laughs) wonderful. You're like flying through this gorgeous polar water And then minute six comes and you feel (laughs) that cold start to seep in. And at first you can, you can fight it and you're determined. And then it just takes hold of you in such a way that it really becomes this mental warfare of, okay, (laughs) focus on the breath, focus on the filming, focus on the mission at hand, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Because oof, with an idle mind under the water, it becomes all consuming. All you can think about is, yeah. oh my God, it's yeah, freezing the cold. cold. Yeah. Do you, is, there, is there some marker for you in mentally where you're like, now is the point where if I don't go up, if I don't resurface, I might get frostbite on my toes or something? Like, is there... Is there anything that that indicates that for you or or is it just experience and knowing like literally looking at your watch I've got this much time and then I got to get out of here. Right. I I think it's a combination of both. I I definitely think experience has been key because mm. definitely diving with more often than not some rather larger men that seem mm. to defy the cold itself. And and just in diving, you know, it takes so much effort to put all this gear on and actually get out to some of these more remote, incredible polar dive sites. Mm -hmm. So you want to spend as much time as you possibly can down there in this gorgeous environment. But what, what my kind of rule of thumb is once you start to hit your personal limit, it's already too late (laughs) because by the time, by the time you okay, tell your buddy, we've got to start making our ascent. You still have to go through your three minute safety stop. And then you have to get up out of the water and then back onto your Zodiac or your boat. Mm -hmm. And the, the time in between those points feels like an eternity and the cold seeps in almost exponentially. And so my, my rule of thumb is If you're starting to get close to your threshold, to your maximum point, that's it. That's it's time to go. There's, Mm -hmm. there's so many other liabilities and logistics Mm -hmm. that could go wrong, not only just from the bottom to surfacing, but Mm -hmm. in general that there's no, there's no point. There's no good excuse for pushing those limits. Mm -hmm. And you definitely have almost this 
kind of false sense of security because once once your limit is pushed or met as far as the temperature goes, um, everything else starts to kind of collapse in on itself. So, so yeah, I, I try to be very attuned to not only my personal limits, but um, which. I have definitely tested <laughs> and learned <laughs> learned the hard way um, of dealing with something like a leaky glove or what have you. But um, communication with mm-hmm. your dive buddy and knowing how to respond in a, a situation where maybe you have passed your threshold for being able to think clearly underwater yeah. has has endured some trial and error. <laughs> I can imagine. And that's that's got to be so critical, having a dive buddy that you can trust in such an environment, because there are so many things that can go wrong. And as you say, you know, you might hit or be close to your personal limit underwater. You've still got to get to the surface. And then you don't know logistically what's going to happen between the time you get back in your boat or your Zodiac and then get back to the mothership, right? Like you don't really oh, yeah. know how long it is between you and warmth. And that's... Yes. So yeah, there has to be like an incredible amount of trust between you and your dive buddy. Now I kind of, I'm curious, I want to go back to this initial, like, how soon can you get here moment, you know, where you suddenly find yourself (laughs) flying to Oslo and then you go up to Svalbard and, and you're on your first real, let's call it a deployment as a polar diver with Nat Geo, right? So you're out there for the first time. You've just met your your new dive buddy who you don't have any pre-established relationship with, I assume. Correct. Tell us about that. Tell us about what it was like sort of entering this universe for the first time. <laughs> yes, it was noteworthy uh, to be sure. My, my first dive up, up in the Arctic was surreal in just about every possible way. We we had a few failed attempts, actually, before we could finally even completely submerge due to some um, dry suit leaking issues with my buddy. And so it kind of took us a while before we finally were able to get into the actual water and go on a dive. So um, the anticipation was very great. But at the same time, perhaps it was good just to experience the water, even if it was jumping in, starting to go down and then realizing, oh, my buddy has a leak. Ah, we have to go back up and cancel the dive. So we finally get in and this incredible, noteworthy bird cliff up in um, Svalbard is known for these incredible nesting birds on the side of this very sheer cliff, this incredible drop-off. And as you might imagine, the cliff doesn't just stop once it hits the water's edge. It keeps going for what seems like forever, but hundreds of meters down below is this. Wow. At first, um, very steep and then more gradual, but still pretty considerably steep cliff. And um, with all of these incredible birds flying around, there's a heck of a lot of guano that's being deposited into the water. And funny enough, there are just like many lichens and other more um, topside terrestrial organisms, there are a ton of organisms under the sea that love those particularly rich in nitrogen (laughs) deposits that are entering the water. And so even though the top side of the cliff is just covered in, you know, black and white birds and these really gorgeous, dark kind of black brown cliffs under the water is this explosion of colors and kelp and different types of algae and sponges of every shape and color that you can imagine. These bright yellows and oranges and pinks and even purples that um, are absolutely flourishing on this very steep cliff. And so when we first roll in and we get down to about maybe 20 um, feet or let's see, like gosh, what is that? Three meters, (laughs) four meters Um, and very shallow. And there is this gorgeous um, kelp bed. So the the difference between a kelp forest and a kelp bed is really just not only the species of kelp, but also the height that it comes to. 
Okay. And so a kelp bed is much more low lying. The blades of the kelp don't necessarily like reach the top of the um, water, like in say something like a kelp forest. And so um, it's fairly easy to navigate and to find actually your buddy because you can be down amidst these really thick stipes, uh, fleshy kind of tree trunk part of the kelp and looking at an organism. And then you pop your head up, up above the canopy and you can pretty easily find your buddy's bubbles off in the distance or whatever, up above where they are in the, amidst the kelp. And so um, we were kind of cruising along, my buddy and I, and he was filming and um, I was there as the safety diver role and just following along, trying to find anything and everything interesting. And so we focused on the shallower kelp beds and then we started to descend a little bit deeper down along this gorgeous cliff. Hmm. And the sponges and anemones were just absolutely breathtaking. Thankfully, not literally breathtaking, but (laughs) (laughs) it was incredible just to see all of this. And then on very clear days, you could even see some of the guillemots diving down into the water from up above. And it's absolutely incredible. You really just have a true appreciation for how intrinsically the water and the earth are so beautifully interlinked. But all of these wonderful thoughts are going through my head and I I'm on my first polar dive. So I think, oh my gosh, I'm the coolest person I know. This is amazing. I have to tell everyone about this. This is so incredible. What a dream come true. And then, as I mentioned earlier, that minute six or so (laughs) starts to creep in. And the cold just comes on like something you've just never experienced before. And it it starts in your extremities, so your feet and your hands. And you start kind of wiggling your toes and trying to wiggle your fingers and keep as much circulation as you can because all of your blood is like, I need to go towards your essential organs (laughs) and keep those ones warm. And so you start kind of doing a, a little bit more kicking, a little bit more moving around to try and keep your body a little bit warmer. And it was really unlike anything else. And so from about that moment in, because I wasn't focused on filming, it just became this mental appreciation for, okay, focus, focus on this organism or this, whatever it happens to be that I'm looking at. Just yeah. at least for one moment mm-hmm. until the time slowly ticks away. And so we're cruising down deeper and deeper along this gorgeous wall. And what feels like an eternity later is really only about 25 minutes. <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yep. laughs> um, but it feels like forever. I'm almost cursing myself like, oh my God, what have I done? What have I gotten myself <laughs> into? This is painful. How am I supposed to concentrate? And finally, my buddy turns around to me and he's like, okay, gives me the hand signals for let's, let's start to go to the surface and get out of the water. And so I was like, yes, okay, I am ready. (laughs) That was great. (laughs) We can get the heck out of here. So I'm, I'm excited. And we had both put more weight in than probably usual because it was our first dive with these dry suits. And so we wanted to be a little bit overweighted. But there's also a fair amount of considerations when you are overweighted and you're diving on a very steep cliff <laughs> to take into account. Mm-hmm. So I had remembered this and as kind of per usual, when you start to ascend and go up, Um, in elevation and you are changing pressure, typically you let a little bit of air out of your dry suit so that it doesn't expand too much um, as you start to rise in the water call. So Mm. I let out a little bit, but not too much, knowing that we were carrying a significant amount of weight on both of us. And as I was kind of 
turning towards my buddy, I saw him turn away from the wall and away from our kind of gorgeous visual reference and look just straight into the Merck. And so, as you may know, the polar regions do not have the most clear, glorious water as somewhere like Tahiti or (laughs) the (laughs) tropics where you can see for miles underwater. But um, because they are so wonderfully productive and rich, you can, you know, maybe a few feet, maybe a few meters is like a good day. (laughs) And so he turns away uh, from the visual reference um, and in just looks into the Merck. And in that moment, he is kind of lifting up his arm to start letting some of the air out of his suit. And what he doesn't realize, because he has lost this now visual reference, is that he starts to plummet <gasps> down so quickly that I think, oh my gosh, has he seen something? Has he found maybe an animal that he wants to film down below? And I think, oh my gosh, I, I got to stop. I got to start going back down. Oh my gosh, I got to clear my ears so that I can go back down. And I was very confused. Uh, yeah. Definitely like, is this normal? <laughs> is yeah. this what's <laughs> supposed to happen? What is going on? So I, I try and stay mindful, keep my training wits about me. And I'm like, okay, just follow him down as quickly, but safely as you can and mm-hmm. go see what the heck he's doing. So thankfully, he was plummeting without realizing, and there was this little ledge that kind of stuck out from the cliff. Thank, honestly, it saved his life. Wow. And he's plummeting down, plummeting down, and then lands completely flat-footed on this ledge, <gasps> thankfully, that was there, and is looking around and looking like below him, like very confused, very panicked motions and freaking out. And I'm swimming down, clearly seeing that something's, you know, pretty wrong. Yeah. And trying, trying to get down there as quickly as possible. And he, at one point, finally looks up at me and has these huge deer in the headlights massive saucer eyes and I'm like oh no (laughs) help him but keep your distance (laughs) Uh uh-oh that's that's not a good look and so he's using all of his might with all of this like a ton of weight granted all of his might to try and push himself off of the bottom and he's so weighted down that he just really can't do it Hmm. and he's pushing and pushing and looking around and you know, looks up at me one last time and then throws the camera off the cliff. (laughs) Oh no. And takes one last huge push and just rockets up to the surface, leaving me What? That sounds insanely dangerous. Oh, it was. Oh, it was. And I'm just left there in the murk. Mind is absolutely racing. I'm like, okay, breathe slowly, breathe slowly, breathe slowly. Yeah. Thinking back, thinking back, what on earth do I do? Do I go after the camera? Is that yeah. my part of my <laughs> job? I'm like, I have no idea where it went. It's dark. It's not clear to see. And also, I may have mentioned we're diving on a cliff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my buddy is gone. And so I'm thinking in my head, okay, it's Nat Geo. They have extra cameras. They yeah. do not have extra dive buddies. <laughs> Yeah. So make sure your dive buddy is okay. So I as slowly do basically what's called an emergency ascent, okay. where you try to control your ascent, but you do go much more quickly than usual. And you basically don't do a safety stop, which was at the end of the day, fine. We were only in the water for really a matter of maybe like 30 minutes. 40 minutes in total. And so I come up to the surface like, oh my gosh, my buddy, where is he dead? Where did he go? Did his brain explode? And I see the Zodiac in the distance and I don't see him. I see oh. our boat driver and I see our, our friend who is helping us. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And so the boat starts coming towards me and I'm like, okay, just breathe, just breathe, just breathe. And then the boat flips around and he's holding on to the other side, just cursing. (laughs) 
You must have been so thankful to see him. <laughs> I was so relieved. I was like, oh my gosh. I I thought he was gone. Like I didn't know. And I get back on the boat finally. I hand up, you know, all my gear and all of this kind of commotion. And then I get on the boat and our friend's like, so where's the camera? <laughs> no. <laughs> like it was no big deal. <laughs> so um a bit of a interesting dive as you might as you might imagine and then yeah. we finally we were meeting back up with the boat and our zodiac pulls up and we dump all of our gear and I'm I'm left to clean everything and yeah and I'm kind of still reeling like Whoa, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry what on earth just happened yeah. And, and, and is this an average day on the job that I should be expecting? Right. I'm hours? like, is this, do we need to talk about this? Is this the <laughs> norm? And um, thankfully that is absolutely not the norm and mm -hmm. um, was a, a combination of issues. But nonetheless, I, I finally put everything away and I'm trying to find people, find our expedition leader to, you know, figure that like, we need to write something down. <laughs> like, yeah. We need to go over a few things. And so I, I finally end up getting up to the bridge and Lo and behold, out of nowhere, I hear over the PA, right in that moment, we've found narwhals. <laughs> oh, that never happens. <gasps> which never happens. Which It is never happens. I, I just, I, I need to say this out loud for yes. everybody who's listening, because I've had so many guests ask me about this or say, oh, what, what trip should I book to go see narwhals? And I'm like, right. they're called the unicorn of the sea for a reason. <laughs> exactly. Well, and... So this, this will make you laugh. So if I say if, because it is so rare to mm. see them, which <laughs> truly cannot be emphasized enough, if you do happen to see them, which finally we start to, you know, zoom in using the most powerful binoculars imaginable, yeah, just barely Far off in the distance, you see something that almost looks like the tip of a submerged bowling ball <laughs> out in a line, out, mm. way out in the distance. Mm. And those were the narwhals. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone is just freaking out. All of the naturalists are like, oh my God, narwhals. Yeah. And uh, all the guests are like a little bit alarmed almost. And, and then they finally are like, wait, that's it. And it was, it was a group, <laughs> it was a group of predominantly females and smaller looking um, narwhals. And yeah. so I did not see a single tusk, mm -hmm. nor, I mean, if you had, you really had to have had some incredible glass near your eyes. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> um, nonetheless, it was a totally incredible experience that was just like, oh, oh wait, back back to what just happened with my first yeah. polar dive. <laughs> what? The how, way. Many, how many things can happen in one day? Oh. It was it was insane. <laughs> it's almost like the narwhal showed up as a consolation prize for the trauma that you had to suffer on your first you, time. <laughs> you survived. Congratulations. Here's one of the most <laughs> rare, incredible <laughs> sightings that can possibly happen oh my gosh. in Svalbard of, of, of all, all places. places in the whole yeah. wide world. Um, Holy so it was a, a memorable one. <laughs> Well, I'm really, I'm really, really happy to hear that that experience didn't turn you off of future polar diving and that you continued on because that, that, that's enough to turn a lot of people off. I mean, what a, especially just as you described the visual, it's not like you were just diving in a, you know, shallow bay or something. You were <laughs> at El Cafila, you were at a cliff that plunges into the depths of like the darkness and it's, I, yeah, it, there's so many elements of that that just sound kind of terrifying. And then to have your to have your dive buddy freak out and like throw this expensive equipment into the abyss and take off. It's like whoa. <laughs> a lot a lot of yeah. people um hear that story and they're like, and you stayed with this? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Th thankfully I I was able to get a few more controlled, um, very different dives in throughout my contract and nice and really allowed for for me to actually explore and truly appreciate and 
fall in love, deeper in love with the ocean, but particularly in polar regions. And so Mm -hmm. as you can imagine, it's not really the easiest thing to gain experience in, Mm -hmm. (laughs) nonetheless, to stick it out because most people that are not blessed with a pinch of crazy are like, no way, (laughs) you're going to pay me to get into that water. And so that eventually led to becoming hyper specialized in diving in the polar regions. And once I kind of got more familiar with and became um, really immersed in diving in the Arctic throughout the Arctic, uh, it, it allowed me to then kind of gain my credentials in order to be allowed to go into the even colder somehow Only by about one degree Celsius, but that makes all the difference, let me tell you. (laughs) Um, Colder water of the Antarctic and um, exploring that equally fascinating realm. Right. And then in the Antarctic, you have, of course, a lot of ice, probably in general, a lot more loose floating ice, I would imagine. And just based on what I've seen anyways. And then also you have a totally different kind of predator, which is spends a lot more time in the water than polar bears do, which is, as you <laughs> talked about earlier, leopard seals. So I, I'd love for you to kind of paint the difference for us between what you see underwater in the Arctic versus what you see underwater in the Antarctic, because I imagine they're quite different. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, just just like on the top side of things, a lot of people think, oh, ice, Arctic, Antarctic, what's the difference? Is there one? Mm -hmm. And to be fair, um, most most people that aren't going to be exposed to these kinds of environments frequently might miss a lot of more subtle clues about the mountain formations or about how much ice there really is. And It is very site specific, but I would argue that definitely diving in the Antarctic is a different ball game. It's not necessarily as similar as you might think. And Mm -hmm. though there are a lot of animals that actually occur in both regions, um, I, I adore the Antarctic because Depending on when, which uh, part of the season you go, it can be a very different ballgame. And more often than not, um, in the Arctic, I like to think of it as jelly soup. (laughs) Mm. And so I have seen more waters chopped, filled with all of this diversity of jellyfish and these small translucent organisms that are not related to, but similar to jellyfish called tenophores Hmm. and tons of these pelagic floating animals that are taking advantage of this definitely nutrient rich Arctic summer. And in general, the bottom of the sea is um, more muddy. And so the visibility is usually quite poor in the Arctic, unless you are happening to be upon um, something like a very sheer vertical cliff where the bottom of the sea is far, far below. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But in the Antarctic, um, things can be a little bit more clear. I will say that um, as opposed to something like jellyfish, more often than not in the Antarctic, I will see a heck of a lot more barnacle molts. And so um, what what folks might not know already, but um, barnacles are these small little crustaceans that are predominantly sedentary and build this calcareous wall around themselves. But just like something like a crab or a lobster, they need to molt their Mm. um, exoskeleton. Mm -hmm. And so the part that they molt is um, their foot, actually, which is what they feed with. And it looks almost like this feathery fan of, um, it does not look like a human foot, that's to be sure. And (laughs) it looks like this beautiful little um, translucent um, feather almost that you can see floating along in the water, which oftentimes, if you're at a penguin colony, will be filled with 
um, feathers. <laughs> and mm. so unlike um, up in the Arctic, where you can have uh, birds like murres or guillemots um, diving down into the water, mm. um, you have penguins down in the Antarctic. And so they definitely will dive bam on top of your bubbles, which is one of the most funny things I've ever experienced <laughs> underwater and trying to not choke on my laughter as these birds are diving down and eating our bubbles. <laughs> um, but the other flip side of that is occasionally you do happen to come across something like a leopard seal. Yeah. And um, I, I would argue they are equally scary, if not more, as seeing something like a polar bear underwater. They definitely yeah. have almost the same <laughs> capabilities with their dentition. And they are one of the most absolutely graceful, intimidating animals imaginable. But I also think that there's there's a lot we still have no idea about them and about yeah. their interactions with people. And mm -hmm. so I have only had positive experience with, with them in the past. Um, okay. Others have been uh, less fortunate. I, I definitely, um, one time at, while we were doing Zodiac cruises, mm -hmm. we had a, quite a few rather very territorial leopard seals in the water that punctured eight of oh, our boats in one kidding. round. Eight, like completely deflated pontoons had to return to the ship. I've never heard was, of such a thing. It was madness. And then honestly, so uh, our poor bosun who's in charge of, you know, fixing all of these boats is like, yeah. you guys, what are you doing? And we're all like, we swear we're not intentionally going towards these seals. Like they're attacking no. the boats. And, and so I have seen that side of them. I have seen yeah. them, you know, tearing a penguin inside out yeah. on the water surface. But my first interaction eye to eye with a leopard seal was while you were diving while diving yes <laughs> was very heart racing and get fine it was fine it was important to stay calm to be sure I was I was diving with two dive buddies at the time one was filming and I also had a camera and then another safety diver was also there hmm. and it was his first Antarctic dive <gasps> <laughs> and myself and my dive buddy were very reticent to bring him along at all. Yeah. But we had chosen a, a rather a safe, rather shallow <laughs> mm. bay where we, we knew the site well and had, had planned on doing a fairly conservative dive. Yeah. And it was the funniest thing. He said something that uh, if you're a polar diver, you might realize seeing a leopard seal in the water is not common. <laughs> it mm -hmm. is not just like the narwhals. It is not the norm to have them buzzing around and approaching you to your knowledge. I will say that. And so before we get into the water, this dive buddy says, oh, you know, are we, are we likely to see a leopard seal? And, and so me and my buddy kind of look at each other and laugh. We're like, uh, pfft. On your first dive, like probably not, <laughs> but A forever, you know, yeah. if you, never if say you never. find one, like <laughs> definitely let us know. And so sure enough, maybe 15 minutes into the dive, we're all poking around looking for sea spiders and anemones and um, things that are fun and interesting to film underwater. And my, my dive buddy come, come, he comes up and he taps me on uh, and he's like, Hey, look around, look around. And he makes this kind of circling motion with his finger, his hand. And, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> what's circling us? Mm. And I look up and then sure enough, not mm. maybe, maybe a basketball court in between me and a leopard seal. And it's looking directly at me. Coming towards very slowly, and it was it was a younger juvenile, which are actually uh, the ones to kind of be a little bit more wary about. Right. Um, they have a little bit more something to prove. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, um, it started heading towards us, and I was like, "Oh my, okie dokie!" 
So I, my first thought is, all right, keep your eyes on the seal, but also look around and find the other dive buddy to alert them that this is now part of the scenario. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully my dive buddy um, was not too far away. And the seal did start doing this very shark-like kind of um, interaction where it would circle us and kind of swim very, very close and check us out and then swim back into the murk Mm. and swim away Mm. and then circle back around and check us out and Mm. look at us and move its head very sinusoidally, almost like a snake. And it would Mm. turn itself upside down and stare at us. And and it was very exciting, but very terrifying. So we we did, we kind of found our our other buddy and got into a little huddle. And like, okay, we're all just going to look at it. And we're going to slowly just start to make our way towards the surface. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. we were pretty shallow. Yeah. And it, it started to come up to us closer and closer. And indeed, leopard seals don't have hands. So they're... <laughs> way of interacting with their world is kind of nipping at it. (laughs) And they are fascinated by our bubbles and by our tanks and our big Mm. air hoses, which Mm -hmm. as you can imagine is a little bit uncomfortable and they are getting a little nippy uh, near your air hoses. So we, we try and keep a fair amount of distance between us as we can. And you know, this, this animal is just gliding like some kind of incredible dancer torpedo that Mm -hmm. can just cut through the water with no effort at all and maneuver in such a way that, you know, it is in charge. (laughs) It is in its environment. And um, even still, it checked us out. It kind of followed us to the surface a little, but then went back down and was almost just seemed like it was playing with itself and flipping around Mm. underwater below us. And so we got to the surface and get everything on remarkably quickly (laughs) (laughs) and get back up on the boat. And then it starts, it's still like coming up to our boat even and doing these little drive-bys. And I still have this video clip of it just coming up closer and closer to the camera itself while we're still in the Zodiac and our hearts are still kind of racing and just, oh my gosh. Um, And it was one of my favorite experiences. And we just look at this guy who it's his first (laughs) and we're just like, come on. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, you don't even know. (laughs) We've been doing this for years, multiple seasons. (laughs) Your first dive. It was totally one of those just like absolutely pinchable moments. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, it's like, I can't, I can't even imagine. I mean, I've been in Zodiacs multiple times when we've had leopard seals nearby and I've been on shore when a leopard seal came right up to the sand and just snatched a penguin that was walking <laughs> along on the sand and then reared its head up with the penguin in its mouth and looked back and forth across the beach. Like anyone want to fight me for it? <laughs> and I was just like, <gasps> you know, and I was screaming into my mic, like to all the other guides, you know, a leopard seal on the beach. And all the right. guests were looking because it's just, they're so, they're, they're so crazy. Like they're so <laughs> big and they're so weird looking and they're so, yeah, it's just such a any time you see one, whether in the water or whatever, like that kind of scenario, like I did. It's just it, it's really breathtaking. They're really they're, they're not a seal in the way that most people imagine. They're very <laughs> different creatures, you know, in the way that they in the way that they present themselves. And so, yeah. you know, you having had this experience with this juvenile in the water, I have to ask when you're in the water with it, and it's coming up and you know like <laughs> playing with your bubbles and stuff do you physically like how how does that feel are you like this thing's massive like do you feel tiny in comparison with it because i think people have an impression when you look at them from a distance or in a picture like oh they're not that big but they're big oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> you feel very small. I mean, and it's it's one of those things where it's it's hard to even conceptualize because mm. in normal society, you know, things aren't just appearing out of nowhere in front of you, like yeah. in the sky <laughs> that are much, much larger than you and um, more easy to move in the air. So 
it's, it's hard to really appreciate just how massive these animals are. And mind you, the wonderful refraction of light and magnification of things underwater makes them seem even bigger than (laughs) they necessarily actually are. Mm -hmm. Um, And so seeing something like a leopard seal, it's, it's truly, I mean, massive. It's hard to really even compare to anything else. But Mm -hmm. one of my colleagues is like, you should treat them and interact with them like they are a hungry mama grizzly bear. Yeah. They <laughs> they are a predator and you are in their realm and they are very capable. So few people have have had really, you know, negative interactions or even mm-hmm. I mean, think with the boat, <laughs> the boat yeah. fighting was definitely a rare and weird experience. So we think mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I think that they aren't necessarily these penguin thrashing monsters 100% Mm. of the time. They're very intelligent, strategic animals, the more Mm. that we learn about them. But I do think that until we do know (laughs) more about them, they should be treated as a very capable predator and not necessarily sought out to interact with. I, I do think that a lot of their displays can be interpreted as a threat that aren't mm-hmm. necessarily. For example, opening their massive gaping mouth right in front of your camera, uh, mm-hmm. which is something that they do love to do, is not necessarily an aggressive threat towards you. Though when you're down there in that moment, it sure is hard to interpret it otherwise. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, we do. We we know so little about them, right? And what we do know is that they're very curious because yeah. you can see that curiosity on display. And certainly, you know, my husband spent a number of years as a kayak guide in Antarctica before he became an expedition leader. And it was quite common, actually, for anytime that there was a leopard seal in the area for a leopard seal to come up and like mouth the end of of his kayak uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know like put yeah. the end of the kayak in his mouth and the you know the seal would put it in his mouth and of course you don't want that to happen <laughs> but <laughs> right. you're in a kayak what can you do if a, if, a, if a curious leopard seal comes along he's going to do what he's going to do you know or she and yes. so you know he's had that experience a few times and there wasn't any detected aggression per se but i mean this seal is like what are you what do you taste like what's your texture mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and then yeah, it's it's so interesting, but we don't know. And I mean, you know, thinking about that scenario where you had a bunch of zodiacs punctured, I know at the back of the zodiac where it kind of goes down into like the pontoons go into that kind of conical shape. Cone, yeah. It's, it's such an easy spot for a leopard seal to come up and, and like get a feel for it. And so right. who, who knows? Like we don't even know if that day that those adventurous leopard seals were angry. Like maybe they were all just like, what are these things that came up and were, you know, used a little bit too much force with their intense mouths and Mm -hmm. and the next thing you know you got eight punctured boats right it's to be fair it's probably fun to puncture a zodiac it probably (laughs) is super fun they're probably like what are these toys that these weird thin-skinned creatures are bringing to us (laughs) yeah yeah um i i am thankful that they didn't puncture my dry suit at any point (laughs) (laughs) no kidding (laughs) Oh, that's amazing though. Like what a what an incredible experience. And it's so cool to sort of live vicariously through you and imagine these scenarios that you found yourself in. And I, I feel like I just want to ask you to continue telling us stories for, forever and ever. Amen. But I don't want to keep you forever. So I think I just have a couple more questions. And one of them is, if there were one thing you wished everyone knew about our coldest seas, what would that be? I think the the one thing that I really wish everyone could wrap their head around for a moment is that they are the coldest, but they're warming the most rapidly. Mm. And what I want people to take away from that is not thoughts of doom and gloom, although it is a rather doom and gloomy statement. Rather, I'd like for people to realize just how connected we are. Even if we live in the middle of a grass plainsland or the middle of a continent that is as far from the ocean or ice as humanly possible on the middle of the equator, 
regardless of that, we are so interconnected and reliant on these incredible places that harbor so much wildlife and so much untamed, beautiful nature that Mm -hmm. is so, so precious in and of itself. But more than that, us at home, even, you know, where I am in Southern California, I like to think that my daily rituals and my daily decisions are linked with these polar environments. They matter. These little microcosms of, oh, I'm going to order takeout and get all this plastic, or, oh, I'm going to drive for miles to go and see some friend on a trip. I I like to think that they matter and that moving with intent or even just realizing that those things are interacting and those things can make a huge difference, I think is really important. And I Mm. I think brings a better appreciation for these far off seemingly fantasy lands that so few people get the absolute privilege and luxury of ever experiencing. And so even if you have no desire to ever be cold (laughs) and experience catabatic winds or um, look under a polar ocean, I'd still, I'd love for everyone to just at least have a respect for the science behind facts that we are very interconnected Mm -hmm. especially through the ocean, whether or not we are actually there (laughs) in polar regions or very far away um, on the planet. Yeah, that's really great insight. Thank you very much for that. And anyone who's to go for that matter, I think that they are, you know, they're kind of you become more aware of that. You become more aware of the interconnectedness. And that's one of the privileges of travel, right? And I hope for anyone who's listening that hasn't had the opportunity to go to one of these places that they can sort of feel that vicariously through your experience and understand that that the interconnectedness is very much a thing, you know, and being responsible for the earth and being responsible for where we are, wherever we are in the world is so crucial to the safety and health of our coldest seas as well. So last question, uh, what is your favorite creature in the polar oceans and why? <laughs> Oof, it's a tough question. It's a very tough question, <laughs> but I think I think one of my all-time favorites that does actually occur in both the Arctic and the Antarctic is Something that has a very lovely misleading name called a sea angel. And when you hear of, oh, a sea angel, what a wonderful altruistic animal, right? They're very, very small, maybe no larger than your pinky finger maximum. And they are these absolutely beautiful, tiny treasures that are planktonic organisms. So they actually swim, albeit not very strongly, through the water column in the ocean. And they are actually a marine snail. And they have evolved in such a way that they have taken what we might think of a stereotypical land snail, um, its big fleshy foot that it crawls along the earth with. Over time, evolution has had the sea angel split that foot into these two teeny tiny wings. And it will actually Mm -hmm. flap these wings back and forth hurriedly, gliding it through the water. And so they're mostly translucent, but they have this little tapering body, their beautiful little wings, and then a rather bulbous head that sits on top of their body with these two projecting horns. And so I like to think of them as, yes, a sea angel. However, they are a sea angel of death. (laughs) (laughs) And in between these little devil-like horns, I will say, they actually have these six hooks that are resting just inside that they can shoot out of the top of their head. What? Latch on to an even more ridiculous sounding creature that is their distant cousin called 
a sea butterfly, (laughs) which has also evolved a um, foot that was split in two to make wings. And they latch on to these sea butterflies. And the sea butterflies still have actually a rather modified but less strong shell necessarily than a normal snail, you could say. And they slurp and pull this little (laughs) sea butterfly clean out of its shell and then bring it back into their head and devour it whole. (laughs) Oh, it's totally an angel of death. Holy cow. Totally an angel of death. And they're the smallest, most beautiful. You would never think they're these absolutely brutal, amazing uh, predators. But I think that has to be definitely at least one of my many favorite. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to include a picture of one of those little creatures in the show notes for this episode, because after that description, people are going to be like, what on earth? What? What is this thing? (laughs) I've got a few. I've got a few. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin, for spending this time with me today. Your stories are fantastic. I know this is going to be just so interesting for so many people to listen to, as I, I'm certain I'm not the only one who wonders what is down below because, you know, we go to these regions and we spend all of our time on land and floating around on the water and the sea for the most part looks dark blue or black. And it, it's the big mystery. What is down below there? So to get to... <laughs> To get to hear from you about these rich creatures and colors and all kinds of amazing things that are happening down there and interactions with different animals is just absolutely wonderful. So thank you so much for your time. And um, I encourage people who are listening to the episode to come and, uh, you know, send in some more questions if you have more questions for Caitlin, because I would be more than happy to have you back (laughs) (laughs) to to talk more about polar diving if people have more questions to ask you. But yeah, anyways, thank you once again. And uh, we'll we'll include all of the links on how people can follow you on social media, etc. in the show notes for this episode. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm happy to talk polar oceans or otherwise anytime. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Antarctic Stories. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you have an extra minute, leaving a rating or review for the podcast will really help us in reaching a wider audience. Antarctic Stories is a production of Twin Tracks Expeditions, a family-run agency of polar guides who have spent the last decade working on polar expedition ships. We bring you unparalleled insider expertise in small ship voyages to the Arctic and Antarctica, and we love sharing our insider knowledge to help you find the perfect ship for your next polar expedition. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, or at TwinTracksExpeditions.com.